Welcome everybody to the Dead Horse Podcast. I am Teja Souza hosting today and with me I have Arvin. Hello. Uh, I've got Ashwin. Hey. And as always Vivek. Hey. And joining us specially today is Rashi. Hi. Alrighty. So um, on on the agenda today, let's let's jump right in. Um, I figure that today we can talk about uh, old mechanics that we've seen in games and something that we haven't seen in a while, you know, just brought back and, you know, maybe updated with a newer engine or just a newer game mechanic sense or game level design sense. So, um, Arvind, why don't you start us off? What would you like to see coming back? Oh, well, so I, I don't know, like, if you have got the hint recently, but, like, I like Deus Ex a lot. And, <laughs> yeah, what, what, what I would like to see come back <laughs> is the, like, multiple approaches in... Like in game levels, like Deus Ex was huge in like, and it had a lot of ways to approach things. There's not enough games doing that. Like even the newer Deus Ex, that was kind of streamlined, I guess. And from what I have heard about the the director's cut, the boss fights aren't really fixed. Like, like there's still no non-lethal way to complete them as far as I'm aware. Like you can sneak and like kill them in different ways. So yeah, what I'm, what I would like is to have more game mechanics interacting than usual. Like even with games that have the potential to be these really huge playgrounds, for example, Planet Side Two or whatever. Ultimately, they just right. end up being massive death matches with, like, with a little bit more strategy required than your usual, you know, Call of Duty kind of games. So that's one thing which okay. I like. I think it's we are really missing the potential right now because. Like we have so much processing power right now with like computers and such, you know. In realistic terms, there's no real limit on a designer's ambition. But yet at the same time, we are continuously focusing on this one. Like either we should just make this or just make that. Actually, yeah, Vivek might want right. to like like discuss this in context with the new Splinter Cell games, which like he's been playing a lot. Yeah. Uh, the Splinter Cell game actually does have a lot of options, but and they streamlined it very well. They have uh, they have three separate styles you can play in called Ghost, uh, Panther, and Assault. Assault is you know you just go in with a like a rifle and shoot everyone. Panther is stealth, but you can kill people, and Ghost is you don't kill anyone at all. And based on uh, how you play through the level, you level up in different ways. Uh, but the cool thing they've done is you can approach a level like there is legitimately seven or eight different ways to approach every level no matter how you decide to play so we've done that well uh, in relation to ashwin's uh, to arvin's point what i think is yeah we we've, we've lost a lot of the large sprawling sprawling level design you, you used to have in old first person shooter games but i think that's been replaced by much more focused event driven missions uh, you don't get stuff like what you used to have in the first halo you don't get the library mission where you have to backtrack continuously because a lot of people in names of large level design uh, essentially make the player keep going back to the same place again and again and again. And it becomes kind of irritating. Uh, I think that problem you, you even see in uh, sometimes like cover shooters like Mass Effect 2. So I think when we've shifted focus this generation to more scripted levels like in the Modern Warfare series and other shooter games, that's that's had its benefits. But I yeah, like I agree that a complete move away from open levels with many ways to approach many ta- different tactical options for the player, that's not a good thing. We should try and have, you know, as much variety as possible in the kind of games that are out there. That's my take on it. All right. And Ashwin? Well, I've been thinking about this and I, I can't really think of one mechanic that I would like to see again with improved technology. But I see mm-hmm. the time is right and it is happening where a lot of old classics are being remade with new technology. Some are handmade, some are a licensed studio made Tales of Monkey Island, sorry, the Monkey Island remix is one example. Then you also have right. community things like the Black Mist uh, mod for Half Life, which is a reimagining of the game. But the funny thing is, this, even though the technology has been ramped up, it looks pretty sweet. It's a different game. I don't know how many of you have played Black Mist, sir, but when I played yeah, it, I've played it, yeah. I found it, it's everything is the same as Half Life, but it's fundamentally a different game. Like the way the in what sense? 
the the gunplay, for example, the balance in many levels that I played, the uh, a lot of tiny tweaks, but it is really a different game. And there are, there are also a lot of remakes in the pipeline. I think they're making a remake of Outcast. They're making a remake of uh, they're making a remake of DSX, for example, uh, a mod mod group. Few of these reach completion, but uh, okay. I'm digressing. So one thing I could think of was the game Vampire: The Masquerade Bloodlines. So that game came out along with Half Life Two, and had mm-hmm. the best facial expression technology of the time. But now that you look back and play that game again, the characters probably just cleaned out. So I wish that game were remade with. Facial expressions like, say, Elena or what I've seen in the videos that I've seen. So yeah, that would be my wish. Vampire: The Masquerade Bloodlines remade with <laughs> up-to-date facial expressions. Nice. That would be awesome. That would be awesome. Yeah. Right. And what about you, Rush? Um. Well, I would say that recent games have too much of quick time events, and they make it look like more of an interactive movie these days. So I think that's not a very good sign. It's not a very good thing because half of the time I'm just watching a quick time event happening, and I just have to press the button whenever I'm, you know, I'm told to. So that's. I mean, I remember, you know, when I was, I used to play Doom. I used to play Commander Keen, or I mean, I I know, I'm, uh, you know, all those old games. I haven't played many of them, but they didn't really have all these things, and I would just keep going, you know, without being interrupted. For a, I don't know, a quick time event. So my only main problem is games these days are being made as movies these days. So I don't really like that. I hope uh, they do less movies and more games. That's all I can say. Right. So clearly you need to play a little bit more of David Cage. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I haven't played any of his games. I haven't played Heavy Rain. I haven't played Beyond Two Souls. So <laughs> yeah, I I think I should stay away from those. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those are pr- you know more or less But completely QG. If you want to try something interesting in that vein, try playing The Walking Dead. If if you oh, like, actually, this actually, I have played The Walking Dead, and well, I did like the game, but I don't know it. It, it felt more of a movie to me, and for some reason, I it worked for me. Yeah, so, fair enough. Like it has yeah. it, The Walking Dead works because the writing is good. A lot of David yeah. Cage's games don't work because the writing is not very good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it seems like uh, fairly logical if you think about it. Like, if you have your game based on like these set piece moments and stuff, like, like have good writing, you know, the you know that kind of thing. It's it's not even that. Have characters that you care about, and uh, the problem with most David Cage games is that the, you don't end up caring about the characters because it it gets very very weird very very quickly. Very quickly, yeah. Yeah. When I played a Heavy Rain, like uh, it started out interesting, you know, uh, you know, the beginning was slow, but it was different, and I could I appreciated the novelty and just the general uh, different differentness of it. But like pretty much like what you guys have said, like it very quickly it gets really absurd. It it's like he's genre hopping and he can't make up his mind on what he wants. And then when you know it's a story driven game and you see these glaring plot holes, you it kind of puts you off the experience. It looks pretty, but it doesn't feel that coherent anymore. I've heard. Um, I mean, most of my friends who played David they, uh, played these games. They either really loved it or they really hated it. There was no middle ground. So. I guess it's a, it's it depends on you know each person. So yeah. There is another way of I think uh, inverting this question kind of when I, mm-hmm. when I think about this. Uh, some of the old games that we see, if they were made today, they would be made in new shiny tech and they would simply not be those games. Like many of the old games are product of the times, the constraints that they had at the time, and that contributed to the the way they ended up. You know that's a little bit terrifying. I, I'm thinking about Black Isle's catalog and whether it would even, like you know, whether it would even be successful today. Uh, like Icewind Dale, Baldur's Gate, would those games be as renowned today as they are, like as revered today as they are. You know, I think this was actually addressed by one of the Obsidian developers. Like they were very against voice acting because, like, what voice acting meant was that your dialogue was frozen. relatively early in the development cycle because it would be sent off to the actors 
to act and rehearse and like you had to uh, compress your stuff to a number of specific words because otherwise you won't be able to afford all the voice acting so yeah. so what this ended up doing was that many of the very very divergent choices were removed because of this and like if you you had those small easter egg moments like a lot of those in fallout and stuff you know so you find this one weird quirky npc that stuff used to be what like the writer would have added in their spare time when they were just you know fooling around that kind of thing so so that sort of stuff is impossible with the newer voice acted games and like i think that's why like they're moving like they've moved away from voice acting again in wasteland 2 so that sort of gives me hope about the scope of the game yeah, yeah. this what linky tournament did with its with its enormous reams of text you would read walls of text and that constructed imagery more vividly than i think any any 3d render would have so it is all in your head right and yeah, yeah definitely that left more scope than something that's expressed expressly said through imagery and another example i had in mind was i don't know if you guys have played another world it's an old game by eric chehi the guy who did from dust yeah i've played it so this game yeah this game had better graphics if you remember and it had a very unique look and definitely this came because of the constraints of the technology at that time if it were made today it would definitely have looked something like maybe capsized or braid and we would have lost something unique so i feel the many of these games and the technology constraints they had they were products of their times yeah for in, in my case uh, what i'd like to see more of in today is just interesting game worlds like I don't know. Ashwin mentioned Vampire earlier, The Masquerade. If you look at Troika's catalog of games, the only one you can even begin to call slightly generic in terms of setting is Temple of Elemental Evil. But Arcanum is like the first the first game I think that they made was called Arcanum, and it's set in a world in, which is a steampunk world in which an industrial revolution is taking place, uh, which is a world that is built of magic, and that setting is. you know finding settings like that in today's video games is hard because if it's fantasy it's generic fantasy based off tolkien and if it's a, a shooter it's a modern military shooter and yeah. if it's science fiction it's very cut and dried like white corridors clean spaces science fiction or star wars science fiction where everything's dirty you know there's no there's no yeah. new ideas in terms of building worlds in video games and i feel i feel that we used to have that earlier and we don't have that now so i'd like to see more interesting game worlds Uh, I think but, uh, Dishonored. Dishonored was a very refreshing change in this case. Uh, I haven't really played a steampunk game before, and I think Dishonored was pretty unique when it came to all the uh, you know all the art style and the world that they created. Yeah, yeah. Dishonored is amazing. The fact yeah, that like there is this prohibition going on in that game, and there are veil oil canisters where it's it's a got a really really interesting world. Yeah. Much more yeah. interesting than the plot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> like the only the only place where Dishonored dropped the ball was the characters. Like no, we couldn't get to care about any one of them. But apart from that, yeah, the world building was excellent. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. After the game was done, my biggest disappoint disappointment was that I didn't see a single whale. And I think. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys play the DLC? Any of the DLCs of Dishonored? Yeah. Yeah, I played Knife no. of Dunwall. Yeah, that has a veil in the like the second or third level, I think, the one with the factory in it. Yeah. I have to buy the DLC now, Arvin. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Just for a veil. Yeah, the veil is actually well, alive, and you can choose whether to kill the veil or not. So yeah, that's a thing. In the, I guess. Oh, kill the veil. Yeah, Do you I get anything know. for killing the veil? Just, you get yeah. some eye or something like Granny Rags asks you to um, do something, right? Like I'm, I'm, I don't remember because it's, yeah. But like you, you can, yeah, you related to some Granny Rags thing. You can kill the whale and like get some eye or whatever from the whale. Granny Rags was probably the best character, the one I remember. Yeah, like the it, outsider. I remember the outsider. The outsider was. <laughs> outsider was yeah. pretty main, right? He gave him the power. Yeah, like he was pretty for like for a person who can like give powers to like anyone, he was too little. Like he was too orderly. Like he wasn't crazy. I guess I wanted a little bit more <laughs> personality from him. Like he was just like he would just appear and be like the most blandest voice actor in they could find. I think the reason I like the outsider is because there's potential for him to be a Loki like character, but they don't live up to that potential. There's a lot of potential with that character. Like, yeah, right. 
homeworld I like Homeworld was one of the first strategy games I played uh, and just like the whole 3D environment you know that blew my mind that you could do that and yes it looked beautiful too and Homeworld 2 got made it even better where you could target uh, specific subsystems in a ship so let's say there was a massive capital ship that was you know chasing your fleet you could take out its engines then take it out from the back because it couldn't turn you could do tons of stuff it's basically what i'm thinking of now is eve singleplayer where you have you know ships in 3d space you have directional damage you know uh, armor plating on very specific sides so you have to you know know where and what uh, where to attack from and uh, you know what angles and it just adds like a you know a much more interesting element to uh, you know to strategy games and that's something that i would love to see brought back Yeah, they just now when you're like when you're describing this as someone who hasn't played a home world uh, what i'm thinking of is yeah. something like ftl but scaled up to 3d because like the targeting specific uh, parts of the ship kind the, it, it's uh, it's something similar see in home world 1 you couldn't do this it, it was basically you had a 3d space you kind of positioned your squadrons in x and y and then you chose a z uh, value with uh homeworld 2 they added the ability to like target very specific subsystems and yes in that sense it was similar to ftl uh i haven't played too much of homeworld uh 2 so i don't remember it as well as homeworld 1 but you did have the ability to get these specific systems take them down and that would affect the whole, the ship as a whole and and one of the other really things that i really loved is like in a way it was very unforgiving the This was the first strategy game I played where the units you finished one level with carried forward and so invariably the first time you play it you ha- you end up restarting because you know you play like the standard standard RTS you know you build a ton of units it's okay you can sacrifice a few and then you start level 2 and you're like wait I have to start with what I with what I just lost or what I have left and so then you know it, it kind of makes you think a little bit more carefully there were it was the game the system but aside from that it was you know it was a really good uh it was really good game overall you might be getting your wish uh, they're remaking homeworld i think it's called homeworld shipbreakers and uh, uh yeah, yeah i know uh, uh, hardware shipbreakers and i'm looking forward to that but i'm not so sure if they have a uh, z axis cuz like from what i've seen so far they have uh it, it's it looks very ground battle oriented so um it's, it's homeworld just, it's not hardware anymore it's it's homeworld now they officially got the homeworld. oh yeah yeah they yeah they got the the ip i forgot about that so the hey if, thing, i'm i'm waiting for more info yeah the other thing i think you might be interested in although it's not like homeworld at all but if, if you like tactical ship battles you might want to check out star citizen because Ooh, yes that, that has all the great. tactical space battles that i think anyone would ever want and people continue to give money to it like i don't know what How, if Chris Roberts wants to solve world hunger, I think he might have a real shot at it. <laughs> it crossed eight million, right? It's crossed twenty-six million, Tejas. God damn! Chris Roberts could actually just hire Isro to build a real life ship for him, I think. Yeah. <laughs> at this oh, point, God. probably. <laughs> hey, but Arvind, what are you talking about? Why should why should Chris Roberts do that when there are so many starving children in America? Because he's a dick, <laughs> I guess. I don't know like yeah <laughs> you should feed the starving kids in America first and then worry about building spaceship yeah yeah what what has been our games for that matter okay uh i think we should like you know stay away from politics and uh, we can move on to our uh, next major one we're talking about assassins creed now whatever you guys want to say you can cuz i haven't played the games so i have very little to contribute on this <laughs> i i played i played a little bit of the first i can say that uh and it was enjoyable though i hated uh riding a horse between cities 
Really, that was the part. that was the best part. <laughs> it really was. <laughs> Apart from jumping from buildings, yes. The the building climbing was fun, but seriously, like riding a horse between cities, I was like, you know, can't I just get there? I I, I died of boredom in those yeah. parts. Yeah, I guess Tejas was it. just like sick of horsing around in the open world. Oh God, <laughs> Arvin, <laughs> no. <laughs> Anyway, Assassin's Creed. I played all of them up to bro- Brotherhood. Yeah, I played all of them up to Brotherhood. Oh, what, what, which ones have you guys played? If you played it, any of them at all? Uh, I was saying <laughs> I played till uh, I played first, second. Um, I played Brotherhood and Revelations and third. And after playing third, I kind of gave up on the series because it was terrible, absolutely <laughs> terrible. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I haven't played the I... late. I stopped with Brotherhood, so I kind of ended on a good note. So I'm picking up Black Flag. Uh, but yeah, what sucked about uh, like what sucks about Assassin's Creed? I don't know. Um, I I'll say that Assassin's Creed stopped being fun after Brotherhood. Revelations was pretty boring. It was pretty repetitive, I would say. And uh, the worst part was Ezio was you know this 55, 50, 55 year old guy, and well, he wasn't his young, charming self. You know. <laughs> uh, that he was in Assassin's Creed 2. So, oh, and he, well, okay, I'll, it's kind of like a spoiler, so I don't know if I should say it, but yeah. So, spoiler, say it, yeah. Yeah, it's fine. Well, well, you know, I mean, they had to end the character, so they sort of, I mean, he dies. So, it, afterwards, yeah, sorry, I have a major crush on it. So, so you know, he was a pretty good character. Um, once this third, what was his name? Connor, I think his name was. Once that guy came, he was an absolute bore. I mean, there was nothing fun while playing the game. I mean, yeah, they introduced some new concepts, you know, jumping around the trees and stuff. But that's just fun for the first 10 minutes. It gets boring okay. later. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to go from, like, you know, ancient Venice and, like, like Florentine to like to straight up like climbing trees and shit. You know, it's like yeah. Very... <laughs> I mean, I mean, Assassin's Creed two and uh, you know the two games that came later, Brotherhood and Revelations. Uh, the best part about those uh, those games was the city, the the place that it was in. It was quite good. Uh, the third game was pretty boring. I mean, there was not much to do. It became quite repetitive, and I mean the the area, you know. There was just snow all around, jungle all around. That's it. So, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, and the story was pretty boring. I still don't know what happens yeah. in the end. <laughs> yeah, like from what I've heard with Assassin's Creed 3 and 4, what they're trying to do is tell uh, the story of one single family. So Assassin's Creed 3 is the story of a father and a son. And Assassin's Creed 4 is supposedly the story of the grandfather. So yeah. it's kind of a prequel to Assassin's Creed 3. And I don't know why they're doing it like, Anyway, the timeline thing in Assassin's Creed 3 is weird, where Desmond is in the future and all this is going on in the past. This is even more jumbled now. Uh, but the reason, the reason I want to buy Assassin's Creed 4 is because... Uh, okay, see, so Desmond, uh, yeah, so okay. basically Desmond is killed, so who cares yeah. about him anymore? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. awesome. I'm really happy he's the worst character in the scene. He's the worst character in the yeah. I but swear, the, it, the most bo- the boring part about Assassin's Creed has always been out of the animus. I don't know why they force us to play that, uh, play those parts. No, but the reason I want to play Assassin's Creed 4 is that this time when you go out of the animus, you are a QA tester in a video game company testing Assassin's Creed 4. Yeah, I think that's the official like signpost for we have run out of ideas of what to do with this <laughs> That's the stuff. best idea ever. Yes. I don't care if we've run out of ideas. That's, that's wait, awesome. wait, wait, wait. You, wait, 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 back up. Are you serious? I'm serious. I'm not joking. That, uh, look, that like, is actually, testers, no way. A QA tester's job is to like repetitively do the same things over and over and try to find bugs. Like that's pretty much an accurate right. description after, of after playing an Assassin's Creed player. That's insanity. <laughs> that's that, awesome. 
That's like that's the only reason I'm buying Black Flag at this point. That's the only reason I'm buying Black Flag. Holy shit! Like that's absurd. Like it's kind of awesome, but also very absurd. Yes. <laughs> If with these progressive installments they're making climbing things more easier which like defeats the purpose of things for me like climbing a building in Assassin's Creed 1 like especially those tall towers was a sort of a puzzle and like yeah, a true. test yeah true true a test for you and like as the sequels go on they're just like now it's pretty much just hold a button and Ezio slash Connor slash whoever the hell you're playing as will just climb the building no no questions asked climbing itself is not a a reason to do things anymore like as a huge fan of the prince of persia franchise like the acrobatic stuff is like why i would play these kind of games so yeah, true yeah that's like the whole series has been like pretty downhill and like plot wise too like the aside from the animus bits like the plot of assassin's creed 1 made sense it had like yeah plot yeah characters. you know that was that was why i actually loved the game you know the, the i was attracted to the game the first time it was it was crazy you know when they said that uh, when they revealed what exactly the animus is and suddenly we have gods who are telling us about 2012 and the world ending i don't know from how we moved from you know the whole memory thing to gods <laughs> what the hell <laughs> <laughs> what did i miss yeah, yeah but yeah like it was you... yeah it was like the crusades and like each person had their own agenda and they they had reasons for doing whatever like twisted stuff they were doing altair himself also had like a good, like motivation to assassinate them so it was a so it was a well written game like obviously not to the standard of contemporary literature or films for example but like, it was well written Yeah, but then from two with like the carnival section, for example, they just completely jumped the gun. Like, like now it's just whatever nonsensical things. Like you can like after the carnival section where you remember you had to get the golden mask, which was supposedly numbered stuff right. like that. I I expected Desmond to just like wake up from the animus, tell the sassy British guy, "Are you just trolling me now?" So it's I just actually enjoyed sense. I enjoyed two a lot. In fact, it's it's my favorite out of the, all the Assassin's Creed series. But yeah, I do agree with your point here. It was kind of irritating, you know, running around and you know trying to get the the golden mask. But I don't know. That was the only yeah. part which was a little irritating. The rest I sort of enjoyed. I think the reason they decided to go with gods in the ending was because Lost had just come out then, and and everyone was very big on building these large and right. un- no. understandable <laughs> mythologies for their. For their video game franchises, <laughs> lost somehow. Uh, yeah, I, I, the, the Assassin's Creed from two onwards, the, the non-animus, like the uh, animus stuff, whatever happened with Desmond, just kept getting stupider and stupider, and I don't know why it was in the game in the first place. And then place. he, like, and then they a, killed him, thankfully. Then they killed him. They killed him too late, unfortunately. By the yeah. time they killed him, the story kind of just it got screwed up. The up. Yeah. My favorite Assassin's Creed is Brotherhood because in Brotherhood you can make a fist pump and four assassins will just assassinate whoever you want them to. Yeah, like, <laughs> that's so what that's like cheating kind of. Like it's like oh, I'm too bored to actually do the But thing I was the game. Like you feel like such a badass though. You feel yeah. like just super more badass. You have the chance to to do your work, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You make a hand signal and like the guy's dead. <laughs> Don't you wish that happens in real life? Huh? I know who you would kill first if you had the ability in real life. Uh, let's no, let's that's a dangerous that's topic. Let's actually, talk about yeah, that. Actually, like, yeah. yeah, I just saw Iron Man three today, so yeah, the hand gestures in those oh. were pretty fun too. You know, like the way it's like, <laughs> yeah, he's like, you know, there's some very very like douchebag style hand action, and then, but yeah, since it's like Tony Stark, hey, he can sell it. Yeah, so. Yep. Okay, uh moving on. Let's uh let's let's talk about an article that came out uh came out a few days ago on Gamma Sutra about uh about the Facebook social game bubble bursting. Uh ha- you guys are uh pretty familiar with it, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, like I'm a pretty hardcore okay. Farmville player, so I'm pretty familiar. All righty. Well, uh just just to kind of recap uh for uh everyone who's listening, I'll try and keep this brief. Uh it's about how the Facebook uh, social game bubble has kind of or is beginning to uh burst and in a sense 
you can almost blame the companies that created the bubble or kind of pioneered it for the practices that they that they pushed forward, which is, you know, basically metrics di- uh, driven des- uh, design, their their philosophies of how to grow and retain your uh, your player base. Uh, a lot of it is, you know, releasing a half-baked game and then kind of adding content based on what people want and all the general uh, mechanics that kind of, you know, are designed to keep you hooked. And it worked in the beginning. It got, got them tons of people. Uh, especially with the old uh, Facebook uh, rules or lack of it, uh, them thereof. But with more privacy settings coming into place, you know, uh, virality is kind of, uh, or the viral nature, not virality, wrong word. Uh, wow. Uh, you might want to edit that out. Um, the, nope, uh, it's definitely <laughs> staying in now. Oh, yeah. goddamn. <laughs> what, 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 did he say something like objectionable? Like, because he made, uh, <laughs> vir- vir- he said virality, and that sounds like virility, which makes this whole podcast, this what? part of the podcast, sound like it's about Viagra. So yeah, more or less. Yeah, it, we just changed. Uh, we have virality is not a word, Tejas, but you just made it one. I, I I have, and we have a title for this podcast now. Anyways, uh, <laughs> <laughs> forging onwards. Um, this. <laughs> So the, uh, with uh, games uh, being less capable of being viral, it's harder to get new uh, people, especially even more so with you know uh, everyone uh, being aware of uh, the practices that now go on. So the question is, now that the b- bubble is bursting, what's next for Facebook games? And you know, so what do you guys think? <clears throat> I would say less dependence on you know leveling up. By because of friends or something. I mean, the, I remember I used, when I used to play Farmville and uh, Cafe World or whatever that game was. There were lo- lots of quests that required help from friends and your neighbors. And frankly, that got pretty irritating because uh, I wanted to level up. I did not have many friends who used to play the game, and I did not want to bug my friends. You know that hey, uh, you know I I want I need your help in this, so please help me out, and you know sending those stupid requests. Um, I wish that most of the the, the games that now come, uh, you know they they don't have so much dependence on uh, friends. They can I can level yeah. up whenever I want to, yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, to, like, to relate this point, like, I would like, like, social games to be more social and, like, as in, like, multiplayer for the player's benefit, as opposed to, let's make more money benefit, you know? Right. Because a lot of those games, the only purpose of the, the, like, sharing and, like, asking friends was, was to gain more users. It didn't enrich your experience if you had 50 friends on Farmville or, like, 10 friends. I mean, I guess you could get some stuff done sooner, but it's not... In the same way, like a squad mate in a co-op shooter, for example. Like this is obviously a very crude analogy, but but yeah, like I would like more social stuff to actually be social as opposed to be purely profit driven. Yeah, it'd be interesting if they if they tried the to bring the survival horror kind of genre on Facebook, wherein you and your friends need to work together to survive, mm-hmm. and that. Any game like that should be free of microtransactions. I understand that microtransactions are the reason Facebook, are the way Facebook games make money, but I think yeah. they have to start figuring out uh, more. Like, yeah. I think this is sort of related friendly to ways that, of making money. What Vivek was saying, like, is it's sort of related to like with the Jonathan Blow talk about the medium being the message. So, like, it's hard yeah. to like envision a game without microtransactions on Facebook, and like, is that a problem of the Facebook platform itself? Or like, is it just um, like a stigmatization, you know, like nowadays, like it's it, just like microtransactions <clears throat> means those kind of games. So, well, I, I think it's a bit of both where at this point, because it's, it, it's been there for so long, it's what you expect. And it's kind of, you know, defined Facebook. And they've also introduced that uh, uh, global coin system that they have in response to, uh, you know, how how pretty much every game was using uh, microtransactions. So yeah, that was I, a I think sort it, of a cash grab on Facebook's part. They were like, yeah, every game is making tons of microtransaction money, so we want some of that. So that's why yeah. 30% of every coin goes to like Facebook now. <laughs> but uh, Ashwin, what do you think? Yeah, a couple of things about this. So interestingly, 
around six months back, if you guys remember, EA folded mm -hmm. up all its Facebook gaming businesses. Right. So once morning, all the studios shut down. And in fact, I was working there and I could see next door a studio shutting down. And in hindsight, it looks like a pretty neat decision, doesn't it? They, they knew that the wave was over, so they decided to ride the mobile wave instead of the Facebook wave. The second thing here is that the it's, it's not really about the microtransactions, that's what I feel, and it's more about the ecosystem. Because the entire mobile business is doing really well with microtransactions. And even, even the free-to-play business on PCs are doing quite well with microtransactions. It's more to do with the ecosystem, I feel where the cost of working inside Facebook's rules and regulations is not really justified by the profits anymore. On the mobile, I think it's, it's, it's far less restrictive when you have the Android marketplace and the Apple store. So I think it's just a paradigm shift. Maybe a new thing will come up tomorrow, replacing mobiles. But, but yeah, it's just a sign of changing times, I guess. Okay. Uh, for, from my end, there's this old game that I remember, and this ties into what uh, you were saying, Vivek, about a shared uh, horror experience. I think a good three to four years ago when I first joined Facebook, there was actually this one game that pretty much would have been right up your alley, given what you described. And the best thing was, it, there, like, it had one microtransaction, and the ecosystem was all, you know, just players. And... It, um, it was called Tooth and Claw, right? It was basically, you choose a faction, zombies, mm -hmm. vampires, werewolves, and humans, right? And they had this giant grid, and each square on the grid represented a location of this town. And for your UI, what you, uh, what you saw was basically a 3x3 three three square of the entire town, with you being in the center square. So uh, you have, like, 150 energy, right? And it, it regenerates relatively fast. I think within eight hours, it would max out again. So you could basically play it in bursts or spread it out. But there were a ton of different things you do because basically this was a like a bit of a territory grab sort of map. And there was tons of territory. So, you know, it, it would just keep going back and forth. And it, I, like, I, I, I want to spend some time like really describing this, but just to keep it brief. There were so many different things you can do, but it was also simple. You could uh, go to a land that was not of your uh, racist territory. You could, uh, you know, destroy it and then reclaim it and then even fortify it. You could, if in real time uh, you see the marker of another player passing by, you could uh, engage them. Uh, of course, you know, lag would be a really, uh, would really kind of detract from this uh, experience because, you know, you know, whoever refreshed faster, you know, attacked faster. But that aside, you could attack, you could even convert players. I've, I've had instances where I was converted to a different race than what I was playing, and then I would get on chat, go back to my racist territory, and just stay out in the open. And as soon as somebody came in in chat, just say, hey, uh, don't kill, but convert. And they would do that. And then there was like this real good camaraderie uh, between each faction where everyone knew each other. And the only microtransaction was that you could buy more energy and you could only do so much uh, by doing that. In a way, it was also its downfall when you could only do so much. Like, let's say I have 150 energy, I expend them and I buy 150 more. There's only so many times I'm going to do this. And let's say I wreck massive havoc, you know, one day by just buying lots of energy. And then I've spent all, my, all the cash that I could on this game all the other players of the other faction will slowly undo the damage you did. It's not permanent. So it was a beautifully designed game. The UI was like so minimalist and perfect. And I, I thought it was like a, like a great example of what Facebook games could have been. And it's sad that that game like within an year shut down. And recently I tried to find their website. Even the website's gone for the studio. So that's a pity. That sucks. Uh, I think I don't know. I'm surprised you didn't bring this up. I thought you would. I thought uh, the I think that maybe the future of Facebook games or where they're going next could be someone uh, brings something like Neptune's Pride or Land Grab onto Facebook and oh. uses the ecosystem of Facebook mm -hmm. to try and propel those kind of experiences forward. I don't know if they would work on Facebook because they're very in-depth experiences. But I I don't know. I think that that those are the kind of games I'd like to see come onto Facebook. 
Yeah. Neptune's Neptune's probably not Facebook would be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think they they add they add a lot of uh, first of all they just add a lot of street cred to Facebook games because there's a lot of nonsense that floats around it. Facebook games aren't real games, all that garbage. Uh, But uh, for better or worse, for to get more people playing Facebook games, you need someone who's with credibility, someone who makes games like Neptune's Pride and games that those games are built around human interaction. And I think it's perfect for a platform like Facebook. I don't know. I think, it but I think another thing that uh, that may be uh, a little uh, dangerous for putting something like Neptune's Pride on uh, Facebook is when you know who you're facing on Neptune's Pride because it's yeah. anonymous. You can you know you take the risk of being you know uh, duplicitous and you know just trying to backstab everybody possible because hey that's the game. But you know Stuff can get uh, really let's say really... you know like there's like even one game I played. I had been backstabbed by somebody. I'm thinking right? this could add so, another layer of strategy where, like, you can attack anonymous. <laughs> yeah, but what I was saying was that, like, yeah, like for oh, example, sorry. like if let's say you, like, I have you on my friend list, so I can either attack you and by by showing you that right. okay, I am attacking you, or I can attack anonymously. So you know, it would be if somebody attacks you anonymously, you would be, like, hmm, who who could this be? You know that kind of stuff. And you can pay one dollar to find out who attacked you. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, no, I, don't I don't think, think it would work like that because, you know, everybody idea. has their, you know, their territory and, you know, that territory is assigned to one player. But either way, like, you know, when, if you are being, uh, if you're playing like a, heavy, a diplomacy heavy game, when you know who the other person is, you know, it can lead to nastiness. Neptune's Pride, it's awesome. They should put it on Facebook. Maybe, maybe not, probably not because people will kill each other once they find out what their friends have been doing to them in that game. There's a real risk there. Yep, there is. Yeah. But dude, like I was telling you, like there was this like awesome match where I uh I literally go to this guy, like he backstabbed me and I kept, you know, dissing him in chat, going, you know, uh basically like going full in character, you have no honor and shit like that. And I goaded him into making like the dumbest attack move ever. And not only could I, you know, turn it against him, but I had another ally who basically backdoored him as well so yeah, that's not such something... a contagious thing to do yeah like it's it's like it's it defines oh, hell you yeah. like that thing <laughs> seems yes, like a does. very emo thing to do so yeah it is in character for you Tejas yeah I, I try really seems hard like to stay thing in that character kid I know would do. Uh, let's move on to the next topic where we are going to discuss Jeff Vogel and his uh, his article where he talks about uh, how indies should approach publicity uh, Arvind you should actually handle this one because this is right up your alley. Okay. So, yeah. So, Jeff Vogel is a pretty, like, veteran indie kind of person. And he wrote a very pessimistic article, which which basically said that what we have right now, where you don't have to worry about PR all that much if you have a good game, is a so golden age of sorts. And he, he stopped short of calling it a bubble because everyone calls everything else a bubble. And then, so, uh, his... Uh, basic view was that like indies should be prepared for a time when everything is not as rosy as it is now and like be savvy with pr and stuff like that promote your game so yeah it was it was mostly common sense just said in a very uh, sort of confrontational slash condescending manner which yeah which is right up my alley now that you think about it but yeah i think he also pointed out that the one of the key factors these days for any indie game to succeed was luck and yeah, it doesn't matter how good the game is. If you don't have luck on your side, you're going to have something of a hard time, which yeah, is... is definitely true. Like in context to like what I'm doing, getting fe- featured on Rock Paper Shotgun on a time when the, the article was on the front page for a very long time, that could be easily called lucky and I wouldn't disagree with you. So yeah, but the point is that like ultimately you need to have a product. So it's like sort of a skill check where... Your skill also matters, but like the dice could just roll a one and it would be a massive failure. So yeah. A D and D reference, yeah. <laughs> good, good, very good. Yeah, that's that's pretty accurate. I I agree. Right. Although I, at the moment I can't think of a lot of indie games that that I think are great that have failed, but I wouldn't be able to because they fail. Yeah. Nobody knows. Yeah, that's, that's the that's the irony of this. You know, there's yeah. a lot of confirmation bias. We look at indie games that have succeeded and say that, hey, if you make a good game, you can succeed. But you don't look at all the probably great indie games that have failed because nobody ever talked or wrote about them. 
yeah i mean like i have been in like a, a lot of bundles and like yeah so i know like a lot of indie games who probably deserve more recognition than whatever they're getting so yeah it's definitely it definitely happens like but yeah like how much it happens is purely subjective and ultimately yeah like it depends on your perspective so should who should be blamed for this happen uh i don't know like bobby kotick yeah i blame him for everything like yeah. okay it's <laughs> <laughs> I think it's it's more or less the way our society is constructed. All of it. In fact, I've been reading this book, The Black Swan, and that beats exactly the same problem. Uh, I'm sure you have read it, but it just says society is broadly divided into two. There is mediocristan and extremistan. Extremistan is where games like where you are either a tremendous success or you just ignore completely. And uh, on the other hand, mediocristan is where you have a conventional jobs. Whether you're a doctor or an engineer, you slog away all your life. You are, if you slog away all your life, you're guaranteed some kind of stability, and you you can live without a problem. Uh, then it comes to games and movies, and I, I remember Vivek putting it very vividly one day. He said it's a crapshoot. That's that, that's really what it is. And like like Arvind said, you make a really good game. and without luck i guess you are doomed to fail and the the thing about uh, the, the thing that you guys just brought up about indie games who might have really good quality but fail you you never consider them that's what you call the silent evidence nobody nobody considers them at all and on top of that i feel a lot of times success is uh, retrospective like If a game succeeds, people find the game to be good, and if it doesn't, we don't really care much about it. Bringing a lot of yeah, like, sort of thing is—it's hard. The confirmation bias is hard to grapple with. Yeah, like uh, this is one thing which I find very annoying. It's, it's like somebody gets most successful, and then suddenly they are like on the conference circuit in like on trade shows like PAGs, GDC, on like how to become successful. You know, like it's that kind of thing where like I know it sounds rich coming from me, but. Was giving a talk at NGC about how to get your game funded on Kickstarter. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean it's it's. The iron. Like, so, like, and and I and I want to know why you don't have a slide with Mogambo from Mr. India going gay formula. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to add that slide. Up. Arvind, you should. Yeah, you definitely should. Yeah, but yeah, like yeah, it's it's a it's a very uh, strange thing where like. basically how you got there is suddenly becomes sort of and it's automatically assumed that since you have made it big you deserve it you know like it's like everyone is like queuing up to say oh yeah that like, you are awesome you know that kind of thing and like you have people making videos about your life and writing books or whatever so yeah like it's it's a kind of weird thing where it it becomes a a landslide kind of thing where it's it keep it keeps getting bigger So yeah, like I'm not sure what the moral of the story is. I guess the moral of the story is like that the world is a unfair place. So yeah. The moral of the story is everybody should just listen to Daft Punk's "Get Lucky" and hope that they do. Yeah. But yeah. not in the context of that song. Uh, I actually have not listened to that song. So. <laughs> so, but like I like that article from uh, Dan of Size Five Games. Like he wrote this small uh, parody article about. <laughs> Like making independent games, yeah. Like I will link it in the description. So yeah, check it out. I think yeah. that's pretty good advice. Yeah, I don't know. I think at the end of the day, you just got to make the best game you can make and hope for the best. Uh, and I think the biggest problem with indie games right now, and the biggest problem with games in general right now, is that games are a very concentrated industry. It's not like other creative industries where in film you have a film industry with almost every country in the world has its own film industry. Right, uh, outside of maybe Africa and even a lot of African countries now have their own film industry. The problem with the games industry is that there is not a localized game industry making games for a local population in every country in the world. Games is mainly based in America, so coverage of games and the success of a game depends on whether the American press covers you positively or whether the UK press covers you positively. Right? Yeah, Once I you guess, have yeah. Yeah, seeing can... games all over the world, then I think it. This will solve a lot of problems. Yeah, of like people. right. Yeah, I guess it's a kind of two-edged sword. Like on one hand, like there's no other medium in which like a person can just like start making games as a single person and like have it shown to people all across the globe. 
but at the same yeah. time yeah like the downside of that is that like there's no uh, like often times like if you are in like any country besides like two or three countries like you have to depend on like other people's perspective like the, the finding your game appealing so yeah yeah especially you have to depend on the perspective of people whom you don't know right you have yeah. to depend like for example for for you and for me we're both making our own independent game right now we're largely dependent on people like total biscuit uh, rock paper yeah. shotgun euro gamer every major pc site finding our game uh, you know like fun or writing good articles about our game yeah and to a certain extent then we have to make parts of our game palatable to their tastes as well right we have yeah. to trust our gut and make the game we want to make but at the same time we can't make it too mm-hmm. alienating to someone yeah that that Which actually reminds me like uh, that's why i think a lot of games made by like developers from india end up being like like if there's an american in the game it's like how an american appears in a tv show because that's yeah because yeah. like how they cuz we don't know we don't really know what am- americans are like in their daily life it's it's we we're, we're pretty much the americans in indian video games are pretty much like the americans in a david cage video game boom oh that's a high, high bar you've set right there <laughs> <laughs> so yeah yeah the world is very unforgiving what's next <laughs> what, what's the next topic make indie games and <laughs> succeed if you're lucky yeah that's the moral of the story yeah. otherwise like i don't know just kill yourself or something moral of the story is do it if you like it otherwise don't <laughs> yeah <laughs> but i think yeah it's very sad that like you know like our industry is one in which there's so much high churn as they call it you know like people get burned burned out they leave a person like with 5 years experience who's who leaves like that's like they had the potential to be like who knows if they had the potential to be something really special in another 5 years because it it takes time to become an expert in any field you know like even if you're just playing a sport or like just running very fast so it, it's very sad because like that's part of the reason why like you don't get games which have a, a really different perspective or like you know on some issues because most of the time games are made by people whose primary like exposure to culture is other video games whereas like you could have like games being made by people with us like for example a drama background or somebody who plays sports or whatever you know so yeah i think that's like one thing which like the churn is causing us to miss at this point i think the the other thing is that because people don't stay for a long time they don't get to learn skills from people who have been in this business for 10 or 15 years yeah. the potential of having another looking glass studios right now or having another iron storm for example is really really low the chance of that happening again is really really low because yeah. most people who come into the industry today they stay for a while and then they leave most of the guys in those studios most of the people who made the who made their sex have left the industry now the, yeah. the big names in those games are still there but a lot of the guys who you know build like who are the cogs who help build things and who have a lot of expert level like yeah. technique and skill behind them aren't in the game industry anymore so there there's no one who can just come in and kind of apprentice with them and learn a skill and then pass that on right that's yeah. that's a problem yeah and if you are in a country like india or if you are in a country like brazil it's even harder because it's unlikely that those guys are going to come to india or brazil and pass on that skill to you or 50 people in your class who want to learn how to design levels yeah i really need someone to design my levels and make a game like thief if anyone from looking glass studios is listening to this podcast please help me yeah, he can he can pay you though yeah so yeah <laughs> You're better off applying to Arcane, actually. Yeah. Hey, shut up, man! <laughs> Help a desi brother out, Arvin. What the hell? <laughs> Moving on, I believe that's uh, all we have for today uh, to talk about. Unless anybody has some uh, something they'd like to add in as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anything else happened? Resolution Gate happened, and uh, Dire Tide Gate happened this week. Does anyone know what <laughs> those things are? Or does anyone care about those things? No, no, not really. I don't know about Dire Tide. I, don't really I just care. know Dire Tide is something to do with Dota 2. Yes. Oh, we <laughs> think that. Yeah. Oh my God. That was the like fans, height of stupid. Fans thing. protested because Valve didn't hold Dire Tide this Halloween. And oh no! Like, and like they protested on Volvo's Facebook page. You know, like Volvo, the yeah, the company but, that makes cars. Like the, not the. the... But imagine what will happen if there is no winter sale this year. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have no, like, I think, like, 
like i think like this the, is some the... obscure dota 2 event which most people who are on steam don't know about if the winter sale doesn't happen this year no i just actually think because valve is experimenting with its economics they decide no winter sale this year <laughs> that would people... be awesome like just just the amazing. fallout the fallout think... would be epic Yes, I think yeah, the people would just like like start picketing actual Volvo offices and like still miss the point completely. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. And there's a like a bewildered Volvo marketing representative going out and giving a press conference saying we don't know why people are picketing our offices. <laughs> we don't make Dota 2. What is this Dota 2? It's not a no, car. No, no, no. They'll, it, it'll be for the winter sales. Like, Volvo... I'm sorry, like Volvo's never held winter sales for our cars. If I was a Volvo executive, I would like launch a car named Dietite to cash in on this whole. Oh. Bandwagon. Like a special <laughs> edition. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like that's that's the reason I am not a Volvo executive. You know. It's <laughs> unlucky. Yeah. Volvo is unlucky. They're really missing something. <laughs> yeah. Relative to resolution gate, like I was going to make a pun about you know load-in screens and like the new Thor movie, but I can't like fit that okay. in now. So whatever. Okay, you watched the new Thor movie in Hindi, Arvind. Oh. Yeah, Wait, so, seriously? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. What, I was what, torn, what was it I called? Was <laughs> <laughs> like it was called Thor to the Dark World. That that till that point it was fine. Till that point everything was in English. Was yeah, since what then did they call the Dark Elves? No, they didn't call any like Dark Elves were never like mentioned. Like they were mentioned as them or those guys. You know, like the, po- the Dero, problem was that Dero, Dero show, yeah, like book my show was like uh, like okay this this show is in English. So I was like okay yeah I'm booking my ticket. But then I reached there and like it's in Hindi, so it's like the worst kind of con. But it was not as bad as like usual Hindi dubs are. So I guess there's that. But I yeah, remember, I guess I'll just I remember watch Tomb it. Raider was dubbed as Sherni number one for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> wow, yes. that, that that brought very traumatic times back for me. Yeah. <laughs> Best title ever. That's classic. Also. <laughs> Arvind, does anyone in in Thor two ever go Loki? If you give us a shock, then I will kill you. Yeah, there was the scene, you know, where like th- like Odin and oh, like, Loki were talking, and it was it sounded straight out of like a serial, like you know, and like at one point, like there was a lady in the audience, and she was like, when like when when Odin Odin asked Loki like like kya hum tumhare pita hai? So, so then like the lady went nahi, and then after a second when she ended, then Loki also went nahi. So it was very like it was very funny yeah like <laughs> yeah but oh, actually like the guy, guy who Odin. yeah like the guy who, who played loki in like who dubbed loki he was pretty good like yeah he didn't completely yeah he sold it like the like thor is basically they, so they didn't to, get ravi kishan to dub as Ro- loki then <laughs> it was not no. bo- it was not it was not a bhojpuri movie right it was a hindi dub so no, no, no. Yeah. yeah hindi dub yeah yeah, well, but even in Hindi dubs, you think that for someone like Loki, they'd get Ravi Kishan or Manoj Bajpayee or someone like that. Although Manoj Bajpayee is actually a good actor. So he might yeah, I actually know. like yeah, related to the dubs kind of stuff. Like for Iron Man 3, like they got a person who sounded uncannily like Shah Rukh Khan. So it was like, you know, I can't live without you, that kind of stuff. So, yeah. I was just about to say that. I was just about to say it. Oh my yeah. God. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, that was kind of funny in its own way, but yeah. We should end the gaming part of the podcast around now. We should. Like, does anyone have anything else to talk about video games? Or do people want to listen about Thor 2? No, please no more Thor 2. <laughs> I don't think people want to get it spoiled, right? Yeah. Ah, there's nothing to spoil. Thor lives. <laughs> no, I mean, Thor 3, Thor lives. Even if they kill him, he'll still come back. Yes. Thor lives, uh, uh, Jane Foster lives. <laughs> Um, yeah. With all that said and done, shall we end this podcast? This is uh, me, Tejas, and the rest of the guys, and our guest, Rashi, signing out. Bye, guys. What, nobody else wants to say goodbye? <laughs> it's the hardest Bye. thing to say. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh. That needs to go in.